Welcome to the Australian National University for the fourth panel discussion in the Vote 2016 Federal Election Series. I'd like to begin by acknowledging and celebrating the first Australians on whose traditional lands we meet tonight and pay my respect to the Ngunnawal people, past and present. Uh, you didn't luck in and get Tony Jones. You've got the poor man's Tony Jones. I'm Stephen Long from the ABC. You might have seen, heard or read my reports over the years on economics and finance. We have here tonight an esteemed panel who I will come to, and I just wanted to let you know first that every Tuesday night in this very theatre, uh, right up until election day, there will be experts from the ANU meeting uh, from the Crawford School in conjunction with Policy Forum Net to discuss the big issues for the election. As I said, this is the fourth of these discussions. I hear they've been very, very good, and I'm hoping that we can match that tonight. There will be a podcast of tonight's panel and every panel in the series, and that will be available on the ANU website. Uh, if you visit the website and click on 2016 Federal Election Series, there's a big banner, you will find that that podcast, and I'd like you to join, invite you to join the Twitter conversation, the ubiquitous Twitter conversation these days, using the hashtag OzPoll or hashtag OurANU. Tonight, I am joined by three of the university's leading experts in this field, not all economists, by the way, to analyse the key tax and economic policies being presented by the major parties during the election. To my immediate right, and that's not a reflection at all on her politics, is Professor Miranda Stewart, who is the Director of the Tax and Transfer Policy Institute at the Crawford School of Public Policy. She is an international expert on tax law and policy. Next to her, we have Maria Ratianero, and that's the last time I'm going to say that, and I hope I got it right. She's here at the ANU Research School of Economics, and she's done some pretty fascinating work on incentives around personal income tax and uh, her main th her main field is research in public economic theory uh, with a view to optimal taxation whatever that means and i guess that means different things to different people uh, john hewson probably needs no introduction former leader of the liberal party of australia almost prime minister of australia uh, the country's loss in that sense is possibly gain to the business community and certainly to academia now where John Hewson here at the university is a professor and holds a chair in the Tax and Transfer Policy Institute at the Crawford School of Public Policy. Now, I hope you are all remembering that phase, Tax and Transfer Policy Institute at the Crawford School of Public Policy because we they are bringing you this event tonight. Uh, so please join me in welcoming the panel. Before we get on to the tax issues, I thought I'd just start by looking at the position we're in in terms of the budget. It wasn't so long ago that the mining boom was in full swing, all the talk was about capacity constraints, interest rates were going up, wages were going up, and the revenue was just raining down like manna from heaven, and all the government felt it had to do was hand over tax cuts. We had seven consecutive years of income tax cuts and there were handouts. It was like the caucus race, the caucus race from, uh, from uh, Alice in Wonderland, was it, or Through the Looking Glass? I can't remember. <laughs> Through the Looking Glass. So I remember the conclusion was everybody has won and all must have prizes. That seemed to be the fiscal policy of the time and we could still maintain Budget surpluses doing that, very different times today. Could you give us a sense of those times and how serious they are, John Hewson? Well, I think uh, you're right. I mean, money was raining down and most of it was squandered, really, in a medium to longer term sense. And uh, the situation today is that we haven't made too much progress in the last several years in terms of budget repair. Governments and oppositions have both committed to return to surplus as fast as possible up until recently. And now they've sort of both quietly agreed in the run-up to this campaign, we'll kick the can further down the road. And, uh, you know, we're now looking at over 10 years or maybe more 
in order to get budget repair. And the bottom line is I think both sides have made very large long-term structural spending commitments that go way beyond the four-year budget period. And uh, they're all unfunded in my view. And so uh, the challenge for whoever wins is going to be actually to face the reality of two things. One, the forecasts on which the current budget is based and the opposition's response is based, we know to be optimistic and they know to be optimistic. Indeed, Chris Bowen in a recent statement to the press club said that he would, within 100 days, have an honest set of forecasts released uh, done by the Parliamentary Budget Office and then he'd bring down a mini budget. So that's admitting that, you know, when we get in there, we'll find out things were worse than we said and change. Uh, and I think that's a major, a major constraint uh, on them because um, those forecasts are, are, are not going to be achieved. And then uh, secondly, of course, the reality of some of the commitments they've made in some areas like national disability, for example, where the costs, I think, will run away in the 2020s. Uh, with very large expenditure required on health, education, defence, national broadband, infrastructure and so on. I mean, it's a very large task. So my bottom line is it doesn't make a lot of sense to talk about, about fiscal policy in an election campaign where we have a big structural problem and both of them are sort of ducking it. Miranda Stewart, Treasury's got a lovely graph called the credible path to surplus, uh, which seems in some senses more like the incredible path to surplus, but certainly there do seem to be some, some incredible assumptions behind that path to surplus. Can you tell me about some of those? So, as, as John mentioned, I think it has, has been widely discussed in the press, there are assumptions about economic growth, there are assumptions about wage growth and so on, and, and that those probably are at the optimistic end. Uh, but actually the budget also contains some, uh, what has been less widely discussed, leaving aside company tax rate cuts, which we might come back to, uh, is actually very high projections of corporate tax revenue over uh, the next few years. Uh, in fact, an increase of as much as 10% from one year to the next, 7%, 10%, another 11%, another 6% each year. And um, it's really, we, I don't think fixing base erosion is, is going to get us So they're increase. projecting that we're going to see company tax grow well, well like multiples and multiples of, of well, GDP the growth. Projection and... depends on a, a, quite high projections of corporate, tax, of corporate profit basically, of, of corporate profit. And we've already seen the current year softening of corporate profit in the mining sector and the non-mining. So I guess it does incorporate this projection of substantial growth in corporate profit in the sort of next three, four years. Do you have any thoughts on that, Maria? One of the issues might be gas, and I don't know if there's people in the audience, but natural gas exports. Are oh, going I thought to you increase. meant gas in the projections. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I make no comment on that. Um, but I do think, I guess the bottom line is that these projections are optimistic, and we all agree on that. And in fact, the Treasury's error John margins Hewson. are pretty. Just going to add one quick point to that. I mean, the only way you're going to get that sort of profitability is to have very significant business investment. And the business investment numbers in the budget don't support that. Yeah. And, uh, There's you know, a the recent clip budget, and we've fallen off The ones it. released recently beyond the, the budget numbers suggest that uh, the hole is even bigger than we thought. I mean, most of policy authorities today are fascinated that with zero to negative interest rates, you know, and a fair bit of fiscal stimulus, that we haven't had a, a significant boom in business investment. And indeed, it's been flat. Most of the earnings numbers on stock markets around the world have been achieved by cutting costs rather than growing the top line. And you can't grow the revenue line if you don't invest. So investment's the key to this. Okay, so company tax, very, very optimistic projections, but I also recall that they were seeing a return to uh, very high rates of nominal economic growth and, and wages recovering. And we've got wages growth the lowest it's been during the time we've had the, the wage price index. And I was trying to get a sense from some figures today and I spoke to a couple of economists and, and, and the views seem to be that the, in nominal terms, this is the lowest wages growth we've seen since the 1960s. Uh, it's quite incredible. And again, that affects how much revenue we're going to have in the budget. So. In the personal income tax, so that wage growth or wage flattening, of course it's all nominal uh, and that is going to affect the, the personal tax collection substantially. 
Well, it's your all nominal, about... Your point about nominal GDP is right. I mean, if you go back to the last budget, they predicted a 1.75 percentage point increase in the growth of nominal GDP. We didn't get it, so they've re-predicted it this year. And it's just <laughs> sliding out because nominal GDP is not coming back, well, as has been predicted over about the last four or five years. If they keep on predicting it, it'll be a sure thing one well, day. Well, yeah. some so, economists so, rely on the fact that I a bit worried, though, because the audience wants us to know about how, which party to vote for, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I gather. I, it, both parties are not talking about this longer-term structural challenge. And, no. you know, we're going to have to come back to it. We're just and sitting it, around here. It's actually quite interesting that in the pre-election fiscal outlook, when the head of Treasury and the head of Finance actually get a, a chance to have their say without the document being interfered with by the politicians, these were the issues they're warning of, that, that we would have to have the highest level of taxation uh, higher than the average of the past 30 years, or spending cuts that we haven't seen to get to that credible path to surplus. And on top of that, we'd have to have major gains in productivity that would require reform and and uh, a trend rate of growth when we're, we're significantly below it. But anyway, look, it is about jobs and growth. We've heard that over and over again in the election. I like to call it the JAG election, the jobs and growth election. And according to the coalition, the path to jobs and growth, over the long term at least, is cutting company tax. Now, let's have a look at that. Will it work? Does it make sense as a path to jobs and growth, Miranda Stewart? Okay. So, it might not be the most popular view, but in the longer term, I think there is probably a very strong argument that we have to cut the company tax rate. And it is quite hard to sheet home the reasoning for that to any one model or any one assertion about one bit of the economy growing. Uh, the biggest reason for it, and I don't want to say it's the vibe, uh, but the biggest reason is because that's where the rest of the world is. We've got a race to the bottom on company tax. So not necessarily the bottom, right? Uh, so, but. The rest of the world leaving aside the United States, right? So the US is a very big trading partner, a very important investor, very important, very influential. But everywhere else in the world, the new normal, I would say, is 25. I mean, it might even be 20. So the question here is not so much should we do it this year, should we do it in 10 years? There's a question of the fiscal cost. It's a big and important question. How do we fund this shift okay. in the economic Let's, let's get to the funding, which is very, very important in just a second. But I'd, li I'd just like to raise an issue about this assumption that we have to do it, it's a good thing. If you look at the, the Treasury's own modelling, they come up with fairly trivial gains over the long term from a tax cut from our current rate of 30% to 25%. So they come up with, with a 0.1% increase in employment over the very long term. Uh, the welfare gains from households on the best case scenario 0.7 and that's on the assumption that if you cut government spending to fund the tax cut, uh, households don't suffer any detriment, um, therefore their welfare rises because the government spending is wasteful, so that's that's a pretty big assumption, and you know the biggest boost is is wages 1.4 percent over the very long term on their best case scenario, but they don't look at distribution, how they're going to be distributed, um, and there's also the fact that that the la they they're projecting that most of the gains are going to go to wages when the labour share of national income has actually been falling throughout the OECD. So even in the long term, on the Treasury modelling, it seems to me the gains are fairly minimal. So is it worth it? So, look, again, I'm sure the others have views, but again, my, my approach is not so much is it worth it, but can Australia exist in the global economy being the only country with a high rate? Now, 
Sure, there are unique features about our corporate shareholder tax system. We have this effective imputation system that many European countries wish they had. They had to abolish it because of decision of the European Court of Justice, not because countries wanted to abolish that system. The US is actually looking at an imputation system, but I bet if they do it, they combine it with a lower corporate tax rate. So the, the bigger question is really, companies are not people. Companies do not bear that tax. The incidence of that tax is unclear, difficult to understand. But that only affects domestic companies because the imputation system, to really simplify it, you know, for those who don't understand, effectively means that if the company's paying tax, you don't pay that tax on your personal tax rate when you get a dividend from the company as an investor. You get a That's credit. A, you the corporate a, tax yeah. acts as a withholding tax for personal yeah. investors in Australia and super funds in Australia. But not, so therefore it kind yeah. of falls on foreign investors. So foreign investment, yeah. attracting foreign investment is what it's all about. John Hewson, um, I was going to ask you to explain dividend imputation because you probably do it better than me. But we'll, I think people get it, so we'll, we'll move on to... Um, what's your view? Is it actually the best path to jobs and growth, cutting company tax? Look, I think the problem is that we're looking at that tax measure in isolation. I mean, what we really need is broad-based tax reform, a part of which would be a lower company tax rate. Although, as you've just said, when you allow for imputation, a 30 cent rate in Australia is like a 20 cent rate to, to, uh, to uh, those who are domestic investors. And the benefit of a tax cut will therefore flow predominantly to foreign and multinationals who we recognise don't pay much tax in this country anyway. So it's rather an unusual set of circumstances. And to pick up Miranda's point, I don't think we know academically enough about the incidence of corporate tax to actually make some definitive conclusions. If you look at the Treasury model, which you've looked at, or whichever model you like, today everybody's got a model. I think they start with a conclusion and try and build a model to, to give them the conclusion they want. Start with um, the conclusion and then come up with the assumptions to make it So you've got two quite work. different yeah. assessments politically now as to whether this will work or not. But my great disappointment is we aren't getting broad-based tax reform where the issue of how you might be financing that uh, is an important part of... of it's not and just the cut in corporate tax, it's how is it financed? And, of course, Bracket the Henry creeple. Tax Review, which mm. recommended a, a cut to 25% in the company tax rate, also recommended a resources rent tax and a broad-based land tax. Mm. And yeah, probably so carbon this issue tax. Of, that's right, of taxing <laughs> capital income and asset values. Mm. If we cut that corporate tax rate, we have to think of it in the context of the broader system and the other taxes in the system. Okay, so, all right, so there's a debate about whether it's the best way to our JAG, our jobs and growth economy, but even if we assume it is, how are we going to pay for it, John Hewson? Just one point about how we got this decision. I'm very cynical about this. I think the biz, big end of town were pretty annoyed with the government and the effects test they introduced in competition policy. So you give them a nod by promising a tax cut but not giving it to them for 10 years sort of gets them off your back during an election campaign but knowing full well you probably can't afford it going into the middle 2020s. Um, but that's well, very cynical view. To answer your question, um, I think that... Um, the way it's being financed in the numbers that we've got for four years is hanging on to bracket creep, uh, which I'm sure you can say something about, um, delaying the childcare introduction, things like that, which politically is a pretty difficult set of circumstances to sell. You know, you're know, going to maintain bracket creep and you're going to, to uh, delay childcare, whereas uh, my wife keeps telling me, you know, whispering in my ear, that uh, the first government to offer free childcare will be in government forever. She sees, she sees it as a, a very, very important issue. You've got one and, you know, job, behind these numbers are decisions like that. Can, can we afford it? How, how do we pay for it? How do you think we can pay for it? I, you might have been asking, what do you think, Maria? What do you think, Maria? Yeah, uh, yeah. I put your body on the line. No, I, 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 I don't think it can be afforded. And, and as, uh, as uh, John uh, suggested, when you, have, when you look at the tax system, you have to look at the overall tax system, not on different parts. Now that you've said that uh, you believe the company tax is going to be uh, financed out of the delaying the bracket creep uh, arrangements, I understand a little bit more why they have gone ahead with the kind of personal 
that cars that don't make any sense to me because well, they are not really doing the okay so let's the let's tax. talk let's talk about that maria in in the federal budget the we heard in the lead up to it from the treasurer how important bracket creep was and what a terrible thing it was and to protect middle income earners they they have uh, cut the threshold on on the on on a tax rate uh, I forget exactly where it kicks in, but Adi, you can tell us. Yeah. Okay, so it, they have moved the uh, threshold in which the 37% uh, uh, tax, marginal tax rate, uh, gets in from 80,000 to 87,000. Now, this would affect at most 30% of the high income earners. It has been portrayed as a relief to middle income uh, taxpayers, but middle income taxpayers are further below in the income distribution. So, so to make it crystal clear, all of the gains go to the top 30%. Top 30%, uh, it, even less than so, because we are only talking about the uh, those with a taxable income. It, it is less than that if you take the full population. Yep. And, on, and in terms of taxable income, on the analysis I saw, 75% of the gains go to the top 10%. Now, uh, business leaders have told me that we need to cut tax rates for people up the top because otherwise we get a brain drain overseas. You've done some, some actual serious academic work on this issue about incentives around work. Is it true that cutting higher tax rates actually increases incentive to work? Well, I've looked through the evidence and there is no evidence that uh, cutting tax at the, at the top particularly uh, gives incentives to labour supply. So most of the original research focused on labour supply elasticity is how people respond uh, to the tax rates through their uh, work hours. Um, the argument that is put forward to reduce tax at the top, marginal tax rate at the top, is that it will encourage more labour supply. But the, uh, the evidence on labour supply elasticities is that they are very low, and there is no compelling evidence that the labour supply elasticities are larger at the top than for lower income It kind of makes sense that they'd be larger at the bottom, or doesn't uh, it? And mm -hmm. at, at, at precisely, and this is what uh, the point I wanted to make, uh, on families, on the second earner, which is mostly uh, partner working mothers. These are the ones that have the higher elasticities and with the current system are getting the highest marginal tax rates. Or the order of 50%, 65%, depending on where they fall, depending on how all these tax uh, transfers that are based on family income kick in. But those tax rates, effective marginal tax rates are much higher than the, the tax rates So tell me, why don't, we see, why don't we see the tax relief going to where it will have the most incentive effect? Probably because, Politics? as I pointed out, it's, it's, it's cost. <laughs> they, fiscal be, cost. they see it as costly, yeah. I mean. Yeah. Fiscal cost. So the median workers and median female workers sit between 40 and 60,000, uh, even lower, of annual income. And there's a lot earning. of them. The tax cut is coming in at 80,000. It's Even though it's, it's a higher a rate, it's worth $600 a year maximum to the smaller percentage of workers. Yes. So it's cheaper, actually, but it can be sold as delivering a tax cut to the average wage earner. Actually, in a very candid moment, I heard Barnaby Joyce during the election campaign say that it would cost too much to give tax cuts to oh, those down right. the bottom. he's right. I mean, he's quite transparent, yeah. actually, yes. in yeah. that regard. So one thing I wanted to say as well, uh, because it's true that sometimes people come and say, ah, but look, the incomes of the uh, higher income individuals do seem to move a lot with uh, marginal tax rates. Now, the recent research uh, looks at how the taxable income moves with tax rates, and it, then this, these elasticities of taxable income incorporate all kinds of margins of adjustment, which are the real ones, how you work more, save more, whatever you do, plus all the tax avoidance, tax evasion. Tax planning. Tax planning. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and this is the, the, the biggest uh, way which in is which a lovely, they lovely modify seg their Which is a lovely segue to negative gearing. <laughs> yes. Indeed. I hope you're all negative gearing. I really, you know, you should be. Uh, there, were, there were reports in The Australian today 
uh, from a whole lot of vested interests arguing that, oh, we're going to see a flurry of people coming in negatively gearing now, which I don't think would necessarily be a very wise choice. But what do we make of the debate? Is it going to crash the housing market if Labor wins office and gets rid of negative gearing on existing dwellings, or will it only have a marginal effect? So, so Labor's policy is to... Uh, yes, uh, only allow negative gearing, using your rental expenses against as a loss against other income to shelter other income from tax yeah, on new properties. That's right. So they, but they protect people. You're all grandfathered, so if you're negative gearing now, you're fine. And you, you and 1.2 million other Australians right, are negatively geared at the moment. Uh, I don't think it's going to cause a housing market crash, which is not to say I, we might see a housing market. It won't be because of negative gearing. <laughs> Something else is going okay. on in the market. Do you have a comment, Maria? So I, I, what I wanted to point out is that it's not negative gearing in itself, because negative gearing was there for a longer period. It's the capital... The, the halving of the capital the gains, gains tax, tax concessions which is under the, the Howard government. Yeah. When you, you really saw an intake on people so negatively geared. So it's two geared. policies combined, right. yes. So when you have to look at it. I don't think it, it will... Uh, take, take removing the negative gearing or uh, uh, reducing the discount on the capital against uh, tax is going to cause a crash. I think there are many other things that are affecting prices. Okay. John Hewson, as a policy in the housing market, as a policy to, to increase rental supply and provide affordable housing, what's your view of negative gearing? Well, I mean, I think to answer your specific question firstly, the, the, the effects will be marginal, but you've always got to look at the effects in the context of what's already happening. And I think that um, in terms of the property market, one segment that is re very overheated and where you will get a substantial correction is in new apartments. Because a lot of people have gone into those, whether they're foreign investors or, or people with self-managed super funds, and they've expected to get capital gain and strong rent. I suspect they'll get neither, and that will be a bit of a significant but down... But Labor's policy will still allow investment in new dwellings. Yeah, to be in, in new dwellings, yeah, uh, whether it allows... Is it in new apartments as well as houses, or is it...? New construction, I think, was... Anyway, the... it's general. Um, I, don't think, I don't think it will smash the housing market, uh, which is the word that's been, been used. I mean, again, I'd take a broader view. You step back from the whole thing and say, OK, Negative gearing is just one of a series of tax expenditures which total somewhere over $120 billion and they're rising faster than, than traditional government expenditure. And they include housing concessions, superannuation concessions and GST concessions, predominantly, the bulk of them. And they're very large numbers. So if you're ever going to reform tax and spending, you've got to address tax expenditures. And yep. in that context, starting on on negative gearing or doing something about the super concessions which are overwhelmingly skewed in favour of the wealthy is a logical place to start. But again, in the context of a total tax reform, not just an isolated measure here and there because that doesn't necessarily achieve okay. your outcome. Well, let's, let's move on to superannuation. Lo and behold, if you go back to, go back, I think it was a decade, uh, Probably 2007 from memory, you had Peter Costello with this bold new plan that people could sacrifice a million dollars into superannuation and this would be a great thing for the economy. Well, it was a great thing for creating a tax avoidance uh, and estate planning mechanism for the very wealthy. Uh, it was a pretty bad thing in terms of those tax expenditures that John Hewson talked about and now we've seen a conservative government undo it. Is the manner in which it's been undone a good thing? Uh, and do you think that there are issues in terms of the, the talked about retrospectivity, Miranda? Uh, so look, I think it's a good thing that it's been proposed. It hasn't been done yet. It's only in the budget. Well, that's true. Don't forget. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and but Labor's, I, Labor's got a similar plan. Look, so, so what Labor has proposed is described quite differently 
but actually more or less has the same effect. More or less. Uh, more or less. So in terms of choosing between the parties on that, they've both, we essentially have bipartisan agreement to shut down that very, very generous exemption and, and concession for retirement. Um, the way it's been done is it retrospective. I don't think it's retrospective. Uh, the measures affect contributions and earnings going forward. Yeah, yes. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. So this retrospectivity argument, if you were to use that argument, uh, basically government couldn't change anything because anything that impacts on someone's existing situation is seen as retrospective. You could only have grandfathering if, if you take that. Yeah. So what do you think, Maria, of the, of the policy change? I, I, as I say, it's good that it's on the table. Whether it's the, exactly the, the precise optimal Mechanism. way of doing it, it's not. But at least, I think, uh, they are talking about it two, two or three years ago, there was no question. What is the optimal way? Uh, <laughs> we will have to be, be a model to look at it. But I think it's clear that the current system is favoring a particular sector of the population. And if I come back to the problem of gender, uh, because it's favoring the high-income individuals and the women are very men. lowly re represented in that group, they are being particularly harmed. And the fact that the um, uh, low-income superannuation contribution has not been wiped out as they had originally planned, it's also a positive thing because it's, 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 it's just redressing uh, a fundamental discrimination that exists in which rich could get uh, uh, yeah. benefit and uh, poor were being taxed more heavily on the it, money it to super than real, on their income. A real irony with superannuation in general that you had a Labor government introduce this major policy change and do it effectively as a regressive taxation system. Uh, wouldn't it have been made more sense? And I think Ken Henry proposed this to say superannuation's income, deferred income, Treat it as income, tax it at the marginal tax rate with a discount for saving. Or you could, and wouldn't that be the better way to do it now? You could reverse it actually, and we have talked to, uh, discussed this a bit with a, in a paper at the institute where you could tax contributions at marginal rates, uh, but then you would exempt earnings and payouts. So it's a kind of a reversed what you just described of a reverse consumption tax or expenditure tax treatment of that saving, and we actually could transition to that system. And in some ways, the measures of both parties move us a little bit in that direction. You could sex that that up by calling it the rever the reverse ferret super reverse tax reform. Ferret. Yeah. Look, but it's I, an area that has to be addressed. It has to be, and in fact, I think we haven't seen the end of it. So no, some people haven't. might be sort of breathing a bit of a sigh of relief. Okay, we've come to a new a new stable position. I don't think the super tax system is stable. I think there is more to be done and probably more revenue to be raised from that system. Well, I, I looked at it about a year ago in detail yeah. and the benefits, as I said, are heavily skewed in favour of the wealthy in the yeah. sense that at the contributions level, if you're on 20 grand a year, it costs you $118 to get a $100 benefit out of super. If you're on 300 grand a year, it costs you 62.50 to get a hundred dollar benefit. So that's massively skewed to the contribution level. We're the only country in the world that gives you a concession on the way in, on the earnings, on the while it's in there, and then you can take it out in some circumstances tax-free. And, the and, and then there's an army of financial <laughs> intermediaries who are making a very healthy right. clip along and the way. Just two other quick comments. I mean, the aggregate of that concession is nearly as much as the age pension. But it's rising much faster than the age pension. So, so there's an area of, of, of difficulty. And the second thing is, where has all that special money gone? It's gone into our super industry, a couple of trillion dollars. What do they do with it? They basically hug the stock market index here and overseas. They haven't had very good earnings on that over the last several years, not even allowing for the, the GFC. So, I mean, there are a lot of dimensions to this problem that really do need serious analysis before you make some adjustments. But I was fascinated in the so-called debate the other night. Both of them were asked, asked, would you, are there any, you know, will you guarantee there won't be any further changes to super? Malcolm immediately said yes, and Shorten wouldn't answer the question. But the bottom line is there will be further changes to the system, whoever's in power. Because we can't afford, can't the afford to continue can't. it, you know. Plus, it's an absurd system if you have a situation where those who need need it least get the most benefit and those who need it most aren't getting enough to to basically mean that they aren't going to have to rely on 
public expenditure through the pension well, anyway. Well, can I just comment? There's nothing wrong with relying on the age pensions. No, so no. let's just take a step back. Actually, it's actually no, but, intended but then, to be there to support the majority of workers are going to need that age pension, regardless of maturity of the superannuation system. Yeah, but how far does it go up that people are reliant? And, and in, if, in that sense, and I'll, I'll quickly finish on this because we've got to get to the audience for questions, but um, it seems to me that... Um, you know, this is a bigger question. Would we have been better off having a system where basically we taxed to pay for a decent pension rather than having a superannuation system? Well, that's a big... Uh, look, we, we have the system we have. Most countries have a combination of public and private provision. It's not always as obvious or clearly delineated as ours, or it looks different, that the policies look different. Uh, most households actually save those who have enough money to save save outside superannuation as well as inside superannuation. So we've always got a hybrid system. Uh, I don't think we could, we're going to eliminate that. So I wouldn't, I'm not in favour of that. But no. I do think we need thought, to fund that age I thought you were an pension. academic and you could answer in abstract terms. <laughs> <laughs> Maria, uh, do you have a view? Well, my, my view is that yes, the, the, the current system have, has elements that are in, in other, in the European systems in which you have uh, the, but the, con the, the payment depends on your contributions. Uh, here we have two, two very separate systems in which you have uh, an, a, pay, an, uh, a pension which, which is uh, financed out of general taxes and this uh, superannuation, which is out of private contributions from employers and employees. And, and this perception that you were putting that uh, relying on the pension, you are drawing on the general uh, taxes. It's what, uh, what uh, so it's stigmatized, it's, it's stigmatized this idea mm. of you have a right to a pension. And the problem I have with the superannuation, it seems to say the pension becomes marginalized and 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 well, if we are giving away money in tax super tax concessions, we don't have the money to fund. But let's let's pension. look on the upside. It supported jobs and growth in certain sex sectors of the finance industry <laughs> and <laughs> expensive real estate in Mossman <laughs> and to, and to the eastern <laughs> suburbs of Sydney. Your question actually asks us to see something operating as academics to see something operating in practice, then see if we can make it work in theory. <laughs> <laughs> I did try that exercise back in 93 where instead of compulsory super, a system based on compulsory super, let's see if we could build a system based on concessions. So we got Daryl Dixon in, who's quite well known in Canberra. We said, let's assume, let's take all the benefits at the time, the five or six billion dollars worth of benefits to super, let's put them in the pot, blank piece of paper, design a new system based strictly on incentive. And um, that was lost in '93. So <laughs> after that, we got the system we got. Oh, you had a lot of good good policies in there in theory, John. I would say you? that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We'll open it up to questions now. Emily's uh, going to take the microphone around. Ellen, Ellen, where did I get Emily? I, I sort of got volunteered for the first question. My name is Randy. I lived in Canberra now ten years. I'm a self-funded retiree at this point one way or another. We need to tax you, clearly. Uh, and <laughs> basically, I, I look on the tax system and all the discussions on policy very simply. People want services. Services cost money. Money comes from taxes and revenue. Yet politicians don't seem to see that cycle. They want to cut taxes. They want to deliver services if they can. But nobody ever seems to complete that cycle that says, if I want to deliver this, I need a way to fund it. Mm. So is that a question? <laughs> well, <laughs> the question is, why aren't politicians brave well, enough? I don't have the answer to that question. Well, I mean, the, an the answer is, <laughs> it, it's Wait. one stage worse than what you just said. They not only want to give more in expenditure and reduce tax, but they also want to repair the budget at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, look, so my response to that, that, that thought is that I actually think we are in this quite tricky political dynamic at the moment and we're not alone Australia we've got our own unique issues you know in the fiscal context but other countries are in the same situation of trying to balance this issue of what are we trying to pay for what's it going to cost 
in the longer term, and are we prepared to raise the revenue we need to do that? I, I, it's really a question about the, the future shape of, of government. It's well, a much bigger it's question. It's a bigger question about the, the question future about shape of society, really, isn't it? Because you're right that we need we need the service. You know, people people are demanding public services, or, or at least we need healthcare. We need education. Uh, there's a whole lot of things that people see as worthwhile, a national disability well, insurance scheme. Let me give you so no, either you right. have to raise the revenue to fund it, or you have to look to more private provision, which has a whole lot of other ramifications and knock-ons. So well, just to give you a specific example, the social security budget is projected to increase quite drastically in some respects, in the medium term and longer. But the biggest driver of that is the national disability insurance scheme. It's not the age pension, actually, for example, even though we're ageing, and you'll hear more about this perhaps in another forum. So we've made that decision. I mean, we're, I don't know if you knew what you were voting for three years ago, but that, you know, you voted for this scheme uh, but bipartisan. But objectively, obje I mean, and we've had, John, you've got views on that as well, I know, but objectively, isn't it a really worthwhile thing to have a national disability insurance yeah, scheme? Look, I, I think it is, and I think that's why you've got strong bipartisan support but that's in principle. Putting it into practice is a much more difficult set of circumstances. And one of the warnings that was given in PIFO by both the Secretaries of Treasury and Finance was just drew attention to one of the risks. And one of the risks in just in the four-year budget period was that the number of people eligible for the NDIS is to go from 30,000 to 460,000 in that four-year period. And that's nowhere near dealing with the longer term the, the, the longer term issue. And what worries me is that, and I'm, I'm on the board of a disability group and so on, I'm seeing it happen. People are going out there raising expectations. You, know, you get a, a mother who's got a, a child with cerebral palsy and you say, what do you want? I expect mine to walk, of course, you know, and I want all the equipment, the carers, the pensions, you know, the, the, uh, the, the physiotherapy and so on to get that. Those costs, those expectations are running away relative to the capacity to deliver even at a base level and the reality is that that child may never walk anyway. So, you know, you've got unfair assessments being made, expectations being built and that's what worries me about it. No doubt about people wanting it and community supporting it but when you get to look out sort of 5, 10, 15 years, whoever's in government is going to be trimming it, targeting it, you know, cutting it back. It's going to be a very, very painful process. Kind of got off track. Next question. Um, hi, how are you doing? Um, I'm not much of a student of economics, um, so my question is rather broad. There seems to be two um, sort of models, one being to lower taxes on the wealthy and business, and the other to lower taxes on the middle class to give them more discretionary spending power. I guess my question is that the, the current Liberal model is to lower taxes at the, at the top end. Is that truly going to build the economy more than lowering taxes on the middle class? Okay, well, in my, in my view, uh, as I said, from the evidence, lowering taxes at the, at the top doesn't have any, it has, it has been shown, it doesn't have any, economic, any impact on economic activity, no impact on growth. It, it, this has been studied for many countries. Now, the and the reverse, the reverse is that you mentioned that uh, the, the impetus of lowering taxes on the middle and the low income individuals to favor spending, I was thinking of lowering taxes on the middle range of the distribution, on the second earners, not only to increase spending, but to uh, increase labor participation, because there is where it has been shown that there is enough response, because it is this well-prepared females, most of the time, that are being caught in this trap of uh, uh, family payments that are withdrawn with, uh, with family income uh, with very, very high effective marginal tax rates, much higher than the high marginal tax rate in the, in the tax tables of the order of 65% in some cases. Can I just come back to something Maria said earlier? I know, uh, and that was about the response is not in work participation, we think, to tax uh, rates, not course. even at the top, the top, but it is potentially in tax planning. 
And so what we'd like to see, and this is similar to what John was saying as well, is not just, you, you might change the rate structure for different reasons, but you need to look at the base of the income tax uh, and the GST. And these bases are kind of full of holes. Yes. We talked about superannuation being one of them, the negative gearing capital gains is another, but there are other planning so opportunities. So in, in plain English, tax planning is finding ways to avoid paying tax. Yes, sure. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Well, of course, that's what it is. <laughs> so that's but, but the point would be that people will potentially, well advised people who have capacity will respond in reducing their taxes. They don't necessarily stop working or doing business, though. Well, you know, I just wanted to call that spade a so shovel, Miranda. Right. So well, one point I might make about the personal tax structure is that we have quite a high tax-free threshold. Yeah. And that has a very practical effect. It means that higher income rates cut in at lower income levels than would otherwise be the case. So if you believe there are incentive effects from tax rates at the margin, then you've made it harder than you need to by having such a high tax-free zone. And uh, when you go up the income scale uh, looking at, at various income levels, you have to go quite a fair way up, you'll know the number, till you get to where somebody is actually paying net tax. So stimulating people to come off the new start benefit or uh, aged person to, to go back into the workforce or whatever, uh, that's not being addressed by the tax system reforms that are being contemplated. Yes. And just to point out on the tax uh, avoidance, uh, there is some very good research coming from the US in which they have looked at, uh, at this issue and they come up with the idea, that, uh, with the research that if you reduce tax avoidance, uh, all these tax avoidance and evasion opportunities. In fact, you could increase the marginal tax rates at the top. So you fix the base, then we can decide as a society what so we think you, the rate should be. If you close all the loopholes and, and avoid, and, and then we could actually, yeah, but who's going to increase marginal tax that, rates at the that, top? Well, that, Abbott did. The Abbott government did, right? They put the temporary budget deficit levy on the top. And now Labor's going to keep it. Labor say they're going to keep it, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. well, what you could do in, in corporate tax and a lot of personal tax is eliminate deductions yeah, altogether yeah. and just lower the tax rate. That's, That's probably yeah. the simplest thing to do. Or in the do. current fiscal environment, just eliminate the deductions. Just eliminate the deductions, deductions. yeah. Because they're the things that get abused by the tax planners. We have a question at the back. I think that that is a very worthwhile point and it actually goes to the nub of the key political difference in this election. If you wanted to boil it down, you have one side saying the long term path to a, a bigger economy, a wealthier society is cutting company tax to grow growth and jobs and the other side saying the long term path is investing in health and education. Do we have a sense of, I mean, if you wanted to simplify it, that, that, that's the two pictures, right? And is it the case that, that I, mean, I know it's very much a simplification, but is it the, is it the case that, that we could actually be costing ourselves if we, if we undermine revenue in ways where we can't invest in, 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 in the skills of the nation and the infrastructure that could attract investment? Sure. We, I mean, we definitely need the revenue, uh, but we, we might be able to collect it by broadening the personal income tax base, uh, strengthening the rate, and possibly, again, perhaps unpopular in this audience, raising the GST. Uh, and in the longer term, again, I think that debate has not gone away. We, we're going to have to come back and think about that uh, in terms of funding the full size of government. But, it, but just to respond to the, to the gentleman's comment, I, I think that China's corporate tax rate is 25% just so we put that on the table. Of course, wages are what is driving 
business investment. Of course, markets are what is driving it. And and skill, labour labour yeah, skill. Yeah, sure. But I, I mean, way I suspect labour cost might still be on the whole more. It might depend very much on the industry you're in. And so skilling up that labour. That labour supply is obviously a good thing, but I think people, businesses are still responding on the margin. The, 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 again, there is some salience evidence, evidence of managerial behaviour that shows that businesses do respond to corporate tax rates. But do they just um, look at the corporate tax rates? Because one of the things that I don't think is considered in this debate is, and you probably know more about it than me, but it struck me that in many countries overseas there are social security levies of various kind on business that we do not have so here. So the, there are social security, they're, they're actually on workers, right? So the social security taxes of many other countries are taxes on wages collected by business. Australia has a payroll tax, low, relatively low rate, quite important at the state level for revenue. Uh, it taxes only half the business ba the base, it, it exempts a whole lot of workers. It doesn't really operate as a tax on workers here, it operates as a tax on business because it's so kind of incoherent. But social security taxes in most countries are in addition to the tax on wages, just like the personal income tax. They're not business taxes at all. There are, just to continue on, that most European countries have lower corporate tax rates than us, but substantial social security taxes on workers. Yes. You agree? Uh, I, I do know they have a, a, a yes, large social security tax because I, I had, a, I had a, a grant that was provided to me in gross and when I went to Belgium I realized that had less than half of what I, okay. <laughs> I thought I was going to get. <laughs> but, uh, but I would, I would think that the, the, there is a combi the things that attract businesses is a combination both mm. of uh, the taxes at the margin and the environment in which they can work. Yeah. Uh, and the delicate balancing act is how with, you know, to use a technical economic term, bugger all revenue, we managed <coughs> to achieve those tax cuts and, and increase skills spending, if you increase spending on human capital and development of the nation. So. Well, but yeah, there's 1.2 million Australians who are getting a little tax cut because they're negatively gearing. Now, maybe you're among that group, and if you are, congratulations, but also, uh, is that appropriate? That's about a, a quarter or less of the actual investee the population and the, the broader taxpaying population in the Yeah, well, it, stri it strikes me as disappointing when you had the current Prime Minister in a treatise on tax that he wrote, what, 10 years or so ago, saying that negative gearing was creating a tax shelter for the well-off, that it was creating economic distortions and a housing bubble. And now we have a situation where we could have had both sides basically look at, advocate some reform on this because the reality is that 90% of the, or more, of the investment has gone into existing dwelling stock. So it hasn't done a lot to increase the the amount of, of, of housing, but it has bit up the price. So in that sense, if that's your policy objective, was to create more affordable housing, it's an utterly failed policy. You're, you're uh, mounting an argument that a candidate in Malcolm's seat of Wentworth is running. He's running entirely on the fact he'd like the old Malcolm to come back. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, um, I think the old Malcolm's, the old Malcolm's done a, fasti a Faustian trade-off uh, <laughs> that was put to him by tech, tech, what are they called, Cros Crosby Texter, to win the election. Is that, that a fair assessment? Yeah, look, if you looked at the so-called debate on, uh, on Sunday night, uh, and by the way, less than 20% of people actually, of the viewing audience actually watched that, when about half the audience had watched The Voice and uh, House Rules and uh, MasterChef, for example. Um, they got quite specific questions from the journalists. And they didn't and they, answer they them. They went out of their way not to answer any of them, but to take your messages, so focus group driven messages, and just keep repeating them. And that's all they do. Another question. Another question. Uh, in getting the budget back to, uh, well, even to balance rather than even considering surplus, there's obviously the question of expenditure and there's the ex uh, question of revenue. Uh, and we've obviously got both uh, problems on both sides of the bu budget, but the general conservative view, and Scott Morrison said, that there is no revenue problem in the budget, it's all about expenditure. 
And this is a general conservative view, and you've seen that with the GOP in the US, that starving the beast is one way to uh, reduce the percentage of the economy that is in the public sector. And there is a general view, and it's been brought up as a question, it was brought up in the, in the leaders' debate, that there is an ideal, ideal level of, uh, of government uh, uh, contribution to the economy that's around 25% or somewhere like that, and we're a bit above that, and the, the view that it should be lower than that. Do we, does the panel have a view as to whether we have mainly a revenue problem or mainly an expenditure problem? And is there any evidence that there is an optimal percentage for an economy to have, in terms of the public-private mix, the government expenditure as a percentage of GDP that produces a, an, eff an efficient and fair economy? Not uh, to answer the first part. You, you can answer. Uh, the I'll first just say, look, uh, there are no magic numbers. I think it's more a revenue problem than a spending problem. I'm not saying you can't be more efficient in government spending, but the sort of commitments that both sides are made, uh, going out 10 or 15 years, say it's significantly uh, significant commitments to expenditure that are going to need to be financed, and uh, then the issue becomes, okay, what's the most effective and fair and so on, simple way to actually finance that? That's the debate, unfortunately, we're, we're not having, which we desperately, I need, think, do need to have because, I mean, um, and you know, look, the, the numbers, percentages to GDP, and I noticed in the leaders' debate they wouldn't commit to any of those percentages either side um, because there's no magic number. I mean, you can use them as a discipline. We'd like to see government spending not go more than 25% of GDP unless, of course, the electorate wants more government expenditure. And then, of course, yeah, you have to go right, higher than 25% of but GDP. But, in fact, both parties do have this sort of rule of thumb, which is a bit number pulled out of the air, which is this 23.9% cap on Commonwealth revenue, uh, which is a sort of an average of previous years. Uh, but if you look at the, there is no matching across no countries. Numbers. I mean, there, there are countries that have 50% of GDP in the public domain and have very substantial and wealthy economies and high economic growth. And then there are countries that have 20%. I wouldn't want to go below 20. It'd be really, I mean, when we started as a federation, we, we, we came into federation with 5% of GDP. Uh, in, in the government. Indonesia has 17%. Uh, you know, these are poor countries. Maria. So I completely agree that it's more on the revenue side than on the expenditure side. And I think that when it's, when, when it's look, expenditure is like something that you are putting down the drain. If you see it as an investment in education, in health, uh, I think there is a there is a, a role to increase the okay, expenditure. Just, I come just, from a European country yeah, just, in which just very quickly though, I think part higher. of the thrust of the gentleman's comment was that on the conservative side of politics, there is basically a sense that we we need to squeeze the public sector and that there's there's a bit of a stalking horse here that 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 there's an attempt to say, well, we actually want to diminish the role of government in the economy. So therefore, this rhetoric, we have it. Is say, it's not just, it's not, you can't just do this party right wing, left wing thing. I mean, John Howard's government was actually the biggest spending government we've ever had in terms of yep. the size of tax in the economy, the size of expenditure in the economy, then handed back in a bunch of tax cuts. I guess maybe you might say he had a kind of a nation building mentality, uh, you know, combined with conservative sort of fiscal goals in some ways and conservative social politics. Uh, so the question to me is this question of what, are we in the business of nation building anymore? Uh, that seems to me to be one of the questions that the population needs to have it'll, a think about. It'll have to be very quick, John. I'm just going to say, look, one thing we've got to do is split the budget into two parts. The recurrent expenditure part, which should be financed over the business cycle with tax. And then there's the, the capital account, mostly infrastructure spending, which you can quite happily finance on a significant percentage of debt. And until we make that distinction and stop clouding that distinction, we won't do much nation building. <laughs> And, uh, you know, we'll have this constant false debate about how we can cut expenditure and cut revenue and repair the budget all at the same time. <laughs> the magic pudding approach. Thank you very much. I found it very stimulating. I hope you have also. And could you please thank our panel?
Thank, thank you all for attending. And remember, every Tuesday night in this venue, right up to the election. Come along.